needs versus meets, the stigma of being labeled an OPCA litigant. In Canada, there exists a case known as Meads versus Meads. The Meads versus Meads ruling was not between an individual and the state, but between two private individuals. In Meads, the respondents' arguments were considered controversial as they were based on pseudo-law consisting of statements, beliefs, or practices that are claimed to be based on accepted law or legal doctrine. At issue, most people of Canada have no basic foundation in law, and in absence of expensive schooling, these people lack any clear direction or guidance as to where to begin. This lack of knowledge drives people to the internet social media system of learning. Often what is learned leaves individuals who self-represent at a distinct disadvantage as their arguments lack of sophistication in matters of law. Their arguments get labeled pseudo-law, subsequently labeling them an OPCA litigant or organized pseudo-legal commercial argument litigant. At further issue, is Meads v. Meads provides 736 paragraphs of examples of OPCA litigant arguments to use as examples against a litigant through applications of syllogism. What is syllogism? In essence, syllogism is the practice of comparing two things that have something in common in order to prove a third thing. The issue with syllogism is it can be used to prove a false statement. In example, a dog is a mammal with four legs. A zebra is a mammal with four legs. Therefore, all mammals have four legs. See the issue? In law, it is the judge's duty to assist. The judge is to educate and inform all parties of the law and legal doctrines that may be applied. In absence of the judge lending any assistance or education to a self-represented litigant, followed by the opposing party applying syllogism in order to prove the litigant is OPCA and vexatious, which the judge recognizes and acknowledges in order to dismiss the argument out of hand on grounds the litigant is deemed OPCA and vexatious, identifies a break in the administration of justice of Canada. To be clear, the appearance of this practice is to use the self-represented litigants' lack of sophistication in matters of law and compare it to the Meads versus Meads shopping list of examples of OPCA litigant arguments against the self-represented litigant in order to dismiss the litigants' arguments out of hand. I was labeled an OPCA litigant and on the following proceeding, before the same court with the same justice of the peace presiding that same justice of the peace in essence rescinded her earlier statement when she on the record recognized and acknowledged i was not an opca litigant and then we won like many people of canada we are researching and learning law to better understand how to defend ourselves while sharing the research acquired on this journey with all. Law is made up of, including but not limited to, rules and legal doctrine. So why do we have law? Well, we are human beings and our typical nature lends itself to being sociable. It is in our nature to desire to live together when we do, we form a society. In order to live in harmony with each other, we need rules. Rules are but one instrument that we use to measure against if one individual causes harm to another. For instance, if you damage my car because you failed to stop at a stop sign, I can use the sign rules, or more specifically, stop sign rules, to help prove my point. That point being, if you had not broken the rule, you wouldn't have damaged my car. Most of us do want these rules. It is why we, the people, create a government. In Canada, we, the people, create governments of the people, by the people, for the people, 
for reasons in example already illustrated. However, it appears most people of Canada who are labeled OPCA litigants are typically facing charges against them by the state. This is true in the scenario this video is founded upon. Like so many others, the state issued a claim against the defendant. Like so many others, the defendant knew the allegations were not just. The question that has driven this research is under what authority do any of these characters of the state or the state itself operate? The authority flows from somewhere. Think of a flowchart and a computer program. The commands flow in specific directions and when there is a break in the command, the program stops working. The authority flows from somewhere. Under what authority? Instinctively, it is this flow of authority that is understood and is at the core of what drives this research. Upon the research of tracking the flow of authority, breaks in the flow of commands is being discovered. It is bringing these breaks to the light, identifying who to bring them before to present in order to repair. Instinctively, the various arguments presented before the court were framed in a constitutional context as it's through this structured argument the flow of authority and its breaks can be identified. Imagine the surprise that near the beginning of the proceeding, the prosecutor began citing paragraphs of Meads versus Meads against the litigant, starting with paragraph 580. Paragraph 580 appears to be the needle in the haystack, the gold nugget we've all been looking for. Paragraph 580 really is the paragraph that is key to what happened in court in October compared to January. It is the point everything this case hinges on. Meads versus Meads, paragraph 580, states, and I quote, for example, a court may conclude an OPCA litigant who argues that no government has the authority to restrict or legislate advances a vexatious argument unless the litigant frames that argument in a constitutional context. Yahtzee. The moving party presented motions to quash in October and were denied their right to be heard. They were denied their right to be heard based on grounds of a past statement made deemed vexatious as its character was unsubstantiated argument with respect to government holding no authority to restrict. The motions brought before the court in October, this past statement from much earlier in the year was neither presented to the court to support the motions, nor did the moving party shed light on it. In fact, the nature and spirit of the motions cured or attempted to cure the defect of this past statement, but lacked sophistication. The motions were framed in a constitutional context to explain why the state exceeded their authority. The past statement was not relevant to the motions made and the nature, spirit and intent of the motions was to cure the defect of this past statement. The justice of the peace ignored or was ignorant of these motions, intent to cure, and the justice of the peace brought forth this past statement from much earlier in the year as grounds to deny the litigant from their right to be heard causing bias against the moving party and a gross miscarriage of justice. The difference between October and January, the argument was cleansed, allowing little to no room to ignore or be ignorant of the framing of the arguments in a constitutional context. The point, the authority of the state and its agents is constitutional authority flows from the Constitution. Any break in that flow causes the program to stop working properly. Any law that is inconsistent with the provisions of the Constitution is, to the extent of the inconsistency, of no force or effect. 
Now you know.